hear me clearly? Yep. Okay, great. Um, as Brenda said, my name is Laura Kieser. Uh, I am uh, the account manager for Dairyland Labs um, out of our St. Cloud, Minnesota location. Um, and um, what when Brenda and um, Colleen contacted me about your webinar today, um, I just decided to keep this really, really simple in regards to sampling and testing forages. But certainly if there are questions that come up, and I hope that there are, um, we can certainly address those as we go along and, and just kind of see where the conversation leads us as well. Um, so I guess, uh, Brenda, as we go along, I'll just ask you to move the slides um, so you can go on to the next one. Uh, this next slide here is the only commercial you're gonna get from me, which is just a little bit about Dairyland Labs. Um, we are a totally independent uh, lab testing laboratory. Um, and we provide testing for feed, forages, soils, water, manure, molds, mycotoxins, uh, anything in the agricultural realm, just about, except for milk. Um, so that's kind of the extent of my <laughs> uh, commercial today. So we'll move on to the rest of the presentation here. Um, I guess first and foremost, why should you listen to me? Why was I asked to do this? Um, probably because I hit the cross section of most of the folks here on the call. Um, I am a dairy goat breeder raiser um, myself with my husband in Jordan, which is just south of the Twin Cities. Um, we raise sun and dairy goats for production, sale, show, um, those types of things. We're on milk test. Um, we appraise our herd every year, so on and so forth. And I've been involved with the dairy goat industry for most of my life um, here in Minnesota, but also in the Northeast portion of the US. Um, and then also had a career um, in extension before coming to Dairyland Labs, um, where now I kind of use that knowledge to help producers and uh, folks in the industry um, with their sampling information, results, uh, packaging, that type of thing. So we can go on. Uh, so just a little bit about what we'll cover today. Like I said, I am keeping this really, really kind of brief. So hopefully this generates some questions, but we'll talk a little bit about forage quality and what that is. We'll talk, we'll give some tips when submitting feed samples to the lab. Um, we'll talk a bit about proper sampling because that probably is the number one thing that impacts um, your success in sending in samples. And then actually we'll also go over some resources that are available to you on the Dairyland website um, that you can look at as you have time. So first, you know, um, I know this is a mix of, of goat producers and sheep producers, probably covering both the dairy and meat side of things. But um, as producers, you know, we should all be concerned with forage quality because it's the thing that potentially if you're harvesting your own forages that can have a really big impact on your budget. You know, as Noah mentioned, you know, the cost of feed has exponentially increased this year. So if we know what we have available to us, we can use those very, you know, different feed stuffs um, appropriately. And I believe uh, Phil Berg will talk about stages of growth and lactation, those types of things. But um, in the interest of kind of knowing what you have and what's in your inventory, um, looking at the forage quality available to you will help you to better use your resources and therefore um, better keep control of your costs and hopefully increase profits. So jumping into some tips uh, when sampling feed. Uh, first of all, uh, you may not know, depending on how ex much experience you have with submitting feed samples, that you have a plethora of options um, to choose from when you submit a sample. Um, the first thing to consider is whether you want to have that sample analyzed by NIR, which is um, spectroscopy, or by chemistry. And when we say chemistry, we mean that kind of vision that you get in your head with the person with the white lab coat and all the chemicals. Um, NIR is a much more cost-effective option for anyone who's submitting a traditional feed or forage sample. Uh, it has, it also has a much faster turnaround time. So if time is of the essence and it's a typical, you know, grass hay, alfalfa hay, any kind of typical commodity, um, NIR is gonna save you time and money and be extremely reliable. 
Um, in our laboratory, all the NIR calibrations that are used are all based on the chemistry that we do in the laboratory. What's important to know though, and this is where some people will get caught, especially with thinking of alternative forages or alternative feeds, is that some product types can only be analyzed using chemistry. A good example of this would be a grain mix. Um, let's say you're using a grain mix of some sort that you're getting from a mill or a co-op, and maybe you're starting to have some problems with it for some reason, and you're kind of wondering you know, if the nutrient analysis has changed. We at the laboratory would have to do that by chemistry because as you might imagine, every grain mix on the planet is a little different. And so it's hard to have a calibration for something like a grain mix that can vary so much. So your best piece of advice with something like that is to probably call the laboratory before submitting the sample so we can talk you through what the best test package would be and the right method for testing. Uh, in regards to uh, submitting a sample, often people will ask, um, what is the right amount of sample to send? So um, the right amount of sample will depend on the product type that you're sending to the laboratory and how you're taking that sample. So on this slide, you'll see a picture. It's one of our sampling bags and you see the black arrow is pointing to a fill line on the bag and it says forage. It's about halfway to two thirds of the way up this particular bag. This would be similar to like a quart size bag. And so if you were submitting forage and using a forage probe or a hay probe, that would be about the amount of sample we'd want to receive from you. Um, if you were submitting um, a grain, let's say a cracked corn or ground corn or soybean meal or something like that, you know, straight commodity, then you'll see a line further down on the bag where it says fill line non-forage. That's for your typical grain mixes. So as you might imagine, we, um, when we receive a sample from you, before analyzing it, it, it gets measured out and goes into an oven so that uh, it's dried and then ground and, and analyzed. So um, dependent on the moisture of that sample too, we may need more or less sample. Um, you can go on to the next slide, Brenda, I think. Um, thinking about also just kind of trying to be most successful when submitting samples, um, if you are at all concerned with mineral levels, um, specifically with something like a TMR. Um, so we can analyze TMR by NIR with a certain package, but the, you will not get minerals reported on something like a TMR. You have to do the, the mineral package by chemistry. And again, it comes back to how variable those can be and how well the NIR can detect minerals. So we definitely recommend um, if folks are concerned about minerals in any way, that those are done by traditional chemistry. Another uh, part that folks might be uh, concerned with specifically earlier this fall would be something like nitrates. We do uh, avidly test for nitrates when requested, but that nitrate test is not part of our typical NIR packages. That would be a separate add-on test. And in our case, it's an $11 test um, to test for nitrates. So that's important for folks to know because sometimes when they send in a sample and haven't done it before, uh, they assume that the nitrate is included. And then finally, um, if there was concern over mold and yeast, um, we have a couple of different ways to do that. We can do a mold and yeast uh, count, which is exactly what it says. They plate a certain portion of the sample uh, and let it grow and just count what's on the plate. Um, and it, so that just gives you a number. If you're concerned with what is actually growing, then you would choose something like a mold and yeast count and ID, which would mean that they would identify the species that were on the plate. Uh, finally, if there were mycotoxin concerns, which we're seeing less of right now, which is typical because we haven't had a super rainy harvest season, um, but if mycotoxins were a concern, we have options for testing um, individual toxins, but also toxin packages that would test um, larger groups of toxins uh, dependent on uh, what the issue was. So you talk with your nutritionist, your veterinarian, there might be issues happening on the farm. We could then narrow down what was the best option for you. You can go ahead. Um, this is just a, a little, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about proper sampling. Um, I know it probably seems pretty basic to say that, 
you know, our result back to you from the laboratory is highly dependent on what you give us. Um, but proper sampling is probably, uh, when you think about the amount of variability and what can impact your result, having a proper sample or representative sample is probably the largest portion of that. So in short, uh, what this is showing you is the difference between if you used a hay probe, for example, versus just grab samples of, of haze. So this uh, particular chart represents alfalfa orchard grass hay in bales and cord, cord samples of that versus grab samples of that. And what you can see here is a dramatic drop in protein in those grab samples, which you can then assume as you're grabbing that out, right? Those any alfalfa leaves, things that are there are probably falling off, you know, a good portion of them. So we're seeing less protein in the sample. We're seeing higher fiber values in the sample because of course, again, you're grabbing with your hand and what's in your hand, those big, bigger stemmy pieces um, are gonna stay in your hand, which is and then in turn gonna affect the energy calculations that are generated um, based on the values that are coming through. So just, um, uh, just a little study to kind of show that, you know, proper sampling, uh, representative sampling really does impact your result. You can go ahead. I'm not sure. Can you see, Brenda, there's a little orange box in the middle of the screen? Oh, let me let me redo that. OK. <laughs> there we go. All right, we good again? Collecting just samples? about. There we go. There All we right. go. Um, so just a little bit more on you know collecting samples in baled hay. And again, um, I apologize if this is too basic. Kind of wasn't sure um, of you know the what the breadth of the audience here. But um, if you are sampling, you know certainly if you're sampling different cuttings, I would consider those as different samples. Um, so if you have a pile of first cutting versus a pile of second cutting, um, sample those separately, you know, try to use a core or a probe, which you can see two examples here in the slide. Um, the first one there can be attached to a drill. The other one is kind of a hand crank. Um, these probes are available for the most part from some, you know, any kind of supply company like a NASCO or, you know, your favorite, whatever supply company. Um, and try to you know, get a representative sample across the bales, across the pile, and try to, to put the probe in, I'll say from the side of the bale, not, or, or excuse me, from the, in, across the layers of the bale, if that makes sense, whether it's small squares, large squares, large rounds, go across the layers of the bale, um, not from the open ends, so that you get a good cross section um, of that. What you wanna do then is, um, core a whole bunch of these bales uh, in that pile, um, empty out your core as you go along, either into a plastic bag or a bucket, depending on how big of a sample you take, you then could subsample that and put that in the bag that you send to the lab. So you can go ahead, Brenda. Um, this is more just kind of about how to store and some more tips about um, those samples. If you're sending in especially fermented samples, like a forage or a corn silage or a TMR, keep in mind, um, you know, when you're sending that sample into the lab, um, this is going to be less of a problem now than it would be in the summertime. But, you know, think about, for example, if you're taking a sample of TMR and you're putting it in the mail on a Friday afternoon, our lab isn't open on Saturday. So even if the mail was amazing and it arrived the next day, which right now <laughs> probably isn't going to happen, um, you know, it's potentially sitting there over the weekend in a warehouse uh, at the post office. So kind of think about when you're putting those samples in the mail, kind of think about how you're handling those. So potentially, you know, if you're taking a sample and you, you know, let's just say you can only take it on Thursday or a Friday, you can throw it in the fridge or the freezer, you know, until Monday if you wanted to, and then pop it in the mail. So kind of think about those things and handle those samples kind of carefully in that way so that things don't degrade um, you know, uh, before they get to the laboratory. Um, and then importantly too, back on that slide, try to give us as much information as you can on those samples. Um, the sample that was there actually has a code on it. We have some e-sampling capabilities that folks can use on their phones, but you at a very minimum on the sample, you know, have the 
product type. So let's say it's a corn silage, um, you know, have some kind of, you know, description for yourself. Um, there's also a, a feed submission card that can go along with it. So a little bit of information goes a long ways when that sample gets to the lab, especially if you're sending us um, similar, you know, similar samples. If you don't label them the way you want them reported, it's hard for us to, to make sure the right one gets to you. So you can go ahead, Brenda. Um, a little bit about, you know, where you send samples. I guess I put this in here mainly because I didn't want to be seen as promoting our lab specifically. Of course, we would love your business, but honestly, what's important is that you are sampling what you have and that you're doing that through a reputable lab and how you can kind of um, make sure that that's the case. Um, making sure that the lab that you use, you know, is a certified laboratory, um, potentially asking them about their quality control, um, asking them about, you know, analytical methods or how they do those things, um, asking them how often, you know, equipment is checked, those types of things will all kind of keep you, keep you kind of on the level with that sort of thing. So you can go ahead, Brenda. This is just a snapshot of our website. Um, and actually what I think I'm gonna do, Brenda, is have you go ahead, if you would, over to the Dairyland website. And I'm just going to show folks a couple of resources that I think would be really useful for them. Um, once you get there and uh, can share your screen, Okay, so the first uh, place you wanna go on the website is, uh, is actually under the, the feed and forage tab right there at the top. You'll see uh, the first drop down option is analytical packages and pricing. So if you would hover on that and then hover on NIR, um, you will see right there, this is the best place you can go to see what test packages are available for what forages. So if you look there, Brenda, at that first product category of hay and haylage. This is going to be for any kind of mixed hay, you know, any kind of, you can see all the packages at the top and the whole chart here shows like what's included in each package and it actually lights up. So for example, uh, the cheapest package is the basic, which is on the far right hand side of the screen. So if you kind of scroll over there, you'll see it kind of light up and you'll see, okay, for 1850 under the basic package, I get all of these elements in my package. So this is kind of a gem on our website when folks start to start testing um, to kind of decide what package they might start with and what's included. And that's available for, you know, for, this is the NIR section. So this would tell you what was, you know, applicable for NIR analysis. If you go back up to the top again, Brenda, you'll see under that same section under feed and forage, we won't go through it, but under analytical methods, there's also the chemistry section. So if you don't see what you would like in the NIR section and it's something special, if you scroll down, you'll see that chemistry packages and pricing. The same thing applies there. There's a chart that will show you um, the prices and what's included in those various chemistry packages. Just like that. Um, okay, and then back up at the top, Brenda, you'll see under, uh, let's see, <laughs> How do we want to do this? Under molds and mycotoxins, I'm going to just show you where there are some fact sheets. So um, there's a whole bunch here about our packages, but here what I think is most useful um, are these mycotoxin fact sheets. So you'll see fact sheets for the majority of the toxins, um, not all, but the majority, and these have all been updated um, as of this January. So they are very recent and they are uh, printable. So for example, if you went to aflatoxin, Brenda, clicked on it, you would see the web page, but you'd also see a printable at the top, which has the very same information that's on the website. So those are all there for anyone to use, as well as the recommendations um, and guidelines and those types of things. Um, back up at the molds and mycotoxins, you'll also see, if you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see um, molds and mold interpretation. So with questions on molds and what levels are safe and not safe. You'll see um, some different guidelines there also with a printable. And then in that same section, Brenda, you'll see under the molds, you'll see the yeast interpretation as well. 
Um, so same thing, there's a principle there with some guidelines. Um, so oftentimes those will answer a fair amount of questions um, that producers may have. The last uh, resource I wanna show you, um, if you go to the top and you go to the resources section and you go to feed and forage, and then you'll see articles and papers. Yep. Um, here, you'll see a whole section here at the top with drop down menus of different things. Uh, specifically, what I wanna point out is the nitrate section. So if you click that nitrate section, the very first one there is our updated uh, nitrate testing fact sheet, but there are a variety of resources available here um, for those different things. Um, and then let's see, the last piece is um, when you get a report back from us, a feed report, I should have had an example here uh, that we could talk through, but uh, it will have um, the values for your sample on a dry matter basis. And then it will have median values for that product type on there and then it will have ranges. So you will have some comparative type information, but sometimes people just want to know potentially historically what to expect. So if you go to that resources section again, Brenda, you'll see on that feed and forage section and then you'll see summaries. This information is older, but again, for people who are just starting out and want something to compare to, let's just take the alfalfa hay at the top. If you click on alfalfa hay, this is gonna pull up a document and it is a historical average of the tens of thousands of more than tens of thousands of samples that have come through our laboratory. And it's going to show you the median uh, normal min, normal max on the various uh, nutrient um, portions of the samples that have come through the lab. So sometimes people find that useful. Um, again, this is very historical type information, but again, something to go back to. So I think with that, I'm gonna stop kind of presenting or talking, uh, see what kind of questions maybe have come through and see where that leads us. So Laura, um, this, is, this is Colleen. So you did a great job answering. There was a question about turnaround time and cost. So you answered that in the presentation. Um, one question is, is how soon um, before feeding should the feed be tested? Okay, well, let me get back to the turnaround time. So. Um, let me specifically say with anything that you submit to us, if it's a typical like NIR test, uh, your sample will be analyzed and, and this is like 98% of the time, your sample will be analyzed and reported the same day it gets to the laboratory. So um, the, the length of time it takes to get to us, we can't necessarily control, but um, we can you know, 98% of the time know that, you know, for a typical NIR sample, the day it gets to us is the day you're going to get that result in your email that afternoon. Now, if it's something that's chemistry, that typically takes um, a little bit longer, you know, to do that analysis. So it might be, you know, three business days or something like that um, before we get that back to you dependent on the test. So specific to turnaround time, I wanted to make sure and address that. Um, in regards to when to test the forage. So the, I'm assuming this is in regards to like take a fresh corn silage and how long to ferment those types of things. Certainly we do test a fair amount of fresh um, product, you know, at harvest time because people want to know dry matters. They want to know some basic information. Um, you know, and we do know that some of those things are going to kind of settle out um, over time as the product ferments. For example, you know, something that may change a you know, a fair amount is going to be starch um, with something like a corn silage. But, you know, it really is going to go to what you need to do on your farm. So, for example, if you're out of corn silage and have to feed, you know, what you're bringing in, well, then we definitely want you to test it to know what you have. If it's something where you can wait, you know, if you have previous year's forage left over and you can wait while that product ferments, then, you know, potentially you're better off waiting to spend your money to test when the, the feed is, is stable, you know, uh, four or six weeks, you know, potentially a little longer. Um, so it just depends on your situation um, and, and what you need to do at the time. Okay, great. Um, what is the best amino acid test for figuring limiting amino acid? Mm, okay. Um, I'm gonna start by saying I'm not an amino acid expert, but we have some amino acid uh, panels that can be used. 
I would have to look at the particular packages. Um, and I know that those can get a little bit expensive. So I'll have to get back to that person on that particular answer. Troy, did you have a question? No, uh, what I would say in relationship to that, it would be uh, ideal if you would have an idea of what those uh, first limiting amino acids are, and then you could work with someone like Laura in regards to uh, picking a panel to address those uh, first three to six uh, limiting amino acids to keep your costs relatively low, but yet get a very good assessment of what your uh, amino acid profile are uh, is, and then it would allow you to work with your nutritionist to uh, come up with a, a plan to address those uh, first uh, three to six limiting amino acids. Yeah, you're right, Troy. I mean, having the help of the producer or the nutritionist and what they want to identify is key. You know, the last thing we want to do is spend a bunch of your money that we don't have to. We're not in that business. Um, we're in the business to help people get what they need in the most efficient way possible. So the more conversation we can have with a customer and what they're looking for, potentially we can, you know, narrow down to specifically what you need. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Um, considering how many samples you've tested. Do you have any data on the incremental loss of nutrition for dry grass hay or typical corn, oats, grain byproduct mixes? Incremental loss. I guess I would need to know. It doesn't seem like a complete question to me. Over so, time. Okay, so I'm going to assume, like, let's take a grass hay and the person is saying, okay, I put this up last year and it's been stored this entire year. You know, am I losing anything nutritionally? I, is that maybe where we're going? Yes, I think you're on the right track. Okay. Um, I would say in answer to your question, which was, have you, you know, studied anything on the sort of financial side of that? No, um, because that's not necessarily the business we're in. Um, I can tell you from a nutritional standpoint, you know, if take grass hay that's stored under cover, that type of thing, it really shouldn't lose much, you know, if, it, if it's stored, you know, properly and dry. I mean, grass hay is a pretty stable product. Um, things that we see change a little bit, you know, is more in regards to like things that are fermented, you know, a, a silage, something like that could change over time. If, for example, let's just say there was an issue with, you know, um, molds or mycotoxins that developed over, you know, over that time, but that's not what the question was regarding. It was more in regards to like commodities and, and dry forages, I believe. Yep. Well, and I'll just give you an example. Um, the, the problem with molds and mycotoxins and all that is that um, they do eat the germ, which reduces the protein. So how much damage do you have in that grain that you're considering feeding? And I think Phil will do a good job of, you know, feeding bread used or doughs is not a good idea with moldy feed because you're opening yourself up to a lot of exposure. And, and um, as far as the, the animal's health, but also the gut health and how they're able to digest those nutrients. And I think, Nan, some of your question is also in regards to, we see a lot of, of possible hay that might be sold this year that is one or two years old. Um, so before you purchase that, you want to get it tested if possible. And then also consider how it's stored. If it's stored on uh, a gr on gr on on the soil and not up on pallets, it does absorb the um, water or it acts like a wicking agent sometimes. So you're going to get moisture in those bottom that bottom row of bales as well. So you'll you'll want to either not feed that or have it tested. Um, the question uh, and an answer here too is is um, and Troy, you might want to chime in here too. Loss mostly in vitamins if put up at the correct um, moisture. Exactly. Uh, most of it, if you uh, store it right and the moisture when you uh, actually harvested that hay was in that appropriate 15% moisture range, 
majority of your loss will be because of the loss of the vitamins. Uh, and you can work with your nutritionist in relationship to uh, addressing that issue. So feeding older hay works just fine, but just be aware that you may have to uh, supplement with additional vitamins specifically. Yep. Uh, Brenda, I see that Phil Berg has joined us and you might want to start the screen sharing with him. So he is our next speaker. And then um, I want to thank all of you for your great questions. This is really what we're hoping for. And then um, we'll have Phil's questions, but then we will have um, Troy and Laura and Phil on a panel discussion at the very end to discuss um, your feed and forage questions as well. Thank you, Colleen. Uh